Well, thank you so much. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, you know, I was disappointed that it wasn't going to be in person. I understand the in-person elections are starting in the fall. Uh, and then yesterday, I, I started to come down with some kind of nasty cold. So it's it's actually much better that this is virtual, because I'm not sure I would even be able to attend if, uh, uh, but uh, because of that. So, um, you know, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, delighted to be here. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about medical device reimbursement, and I, I, the course I teach at at uh, the University of Toronto is medical re device reimbursement. So this is a this is an attempt to to bring all of that uh, course down to uh, uh, to an hour's lecture. So um, uh, and um, uh, Ahmed is is bang on it. It it is it it is uh, to be interactive. So I will be calling on participants. Um, although Ahmed, I might ask for your help there because I'm I don't I'm not seeing um, on my Zoom I'm not seeing the participants so I might ask you to help me out with that. Um, so uh, yeah, please use the hands up function is 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 the best way. Um, and um, uh, with uh, with that, I think um, I think we could uh, we get going on 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 medical device reimbursement. Um, Oh. Hello, oh, hang on a second. I'm, I'm just getting a call here. Uh, hello, hello, hello. This, I, I tell you what, this this phone. Uh, it used to be a great phone, but it's not it's not working anymore. Can you can you guys see my really nice fancy flip phone? I got this in in 1999. Uh, takes calls. It's a little screen here. It takes pictures. I can send texts. It's it's a it's a pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable phone. Um, I, I got to say though, I got to get a new one, and I'm I'm guessing that there are some probably technologically savvy people on the on the line there. Um, so I got I got to ask for a little bit of help. I understand that there are these things called smartphones, and some of you may may have those. So I is there somebody that can volunteer? Does someone have one of these that can tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, again, I cannot, I cannot see any of the people. So you're going to have to, uh, I can see uh, Mar Marc Antoine Belanger. Do you have, do you have a phone? Hi, yes, I do. What, what kind of phone do you have? Um, very typical uh, red iPhone. Um, very typical millennial on, the, on my end. Uh, uh, you got a you got an iPhone, and then what? So there are different versions of that, I understand. So what what version do you have? I believe it's the eleven. I'm not sure anymore. Ooh, uh, the eleven. Okay, track, that's honestly. so that's pretty fancy. What what did you pay for that? It, it is included in my uh, monthly plan, so I can tell you the exact price. But there was a I think I believe I pay like twenty dollars a month on it. Uh, uh, with the financing rates and everything, that seems pretty reasonable. Is any, has anyone paid outright for their phone? Can tell me how much how much they paid for it? Um, anybody putting up their hand? Sorry, I don't see anyone uh, putting uh, up. Um, do you have, what? How much did you pay for your phone? Uh, so the monthly bill? No, no. Just did you buy it outright? Uh, so uh, yeah, I bought it outright. Yeah. That's what, and how much did you pay for it? I think it was eleven hundred, or uh, yeah, I think eleven hundred about right. Eleven, eleven, eleven hundred dollars. Okay, all right. Hey, hey, Mark, it's Rav. Hey, Rav. Hey, how you doing? I'm I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Well, the uh, good news is I I used to have a BlackBerry until very recently, and I just did decide to upgrade my technology, and I moved to the iPhone 14 Pro. And I did buy it outright, and with tax, it came out to about fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars—that's that's impressive. So you were just a little bit ahead of me on, on the BlackBerry. All right, so let's. So that's prob. That's the latest iPhone, latest cost. Who who's got? G give me something that's that's cheaper, because I'm a I'm a cost conscious guy. Um, somebody somebody tell me that they've got a phone that I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. Who who's got a who's got a cheaper phone? We have Mary in the chat saying she got an Android for four hundred dollars. Uh, Mary, oh, thanks, Mary. Four hundred bucks, and something called an Android. Okay, that's that's more my speed. Anybody, anybody less than a 
less than 400 bucks. I'll, I'll go to the chat here and see what we, Samsung, um, 1300, about 1K. Anybody, anybody less than 400? Okay, Rav, I'm gonna put you on the spot again. What, what does your phone do? You, you've had it for a couple of weeks now, I guess. What, what can you do with it? Well, uh, I guess uh, going from a BlackBerry, obviously, I always knew I had to upgrade my technology. So it's just a matter of time. So I decided if I'm going to make that change, then, um, you know, it's that good, better, best. And sounding like this was the best fit, considering this is going to be a long term investment. So it provides, I guess, the standard services, which maybe, you know, the iPhone 11 also does. But I guess it's the speed of the processor and the service and all the value adds that go with it that were attractive to myself. All right. But it's, I, you, you just give me the basics here. Like you, you can make phone calls with it, right? Exactly. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Good. And, and I understand that maybe you could send emails, right? Correct. All right. And, and, and what else can you do? Email text. I mean, obviously, uh, um, you know, I just use it for the basics, but obviously you can do the notes and uh, there's multiple features uh, within it. But, uh, you know, for, for myself, the main feature was, you know, the speed of the processor and the help desk and uh, support that they provide behind it, which I thought was uh, worthwhile now that I'm making this change. And on top, I must say, they helped me with the transition as well in terms of getting my information from my old technology loaded to my new technology. Good, good customer service. Oh, OK. So I'm, I'm getting here that you can take pictures as well. That's good because my old phone... Uh, takes pictures as well. Mary, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So um, is is what 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 can your what what does Rav's phone do that that yours doesn't do the list that he gave you? Is there anything that that your phone doesn't do? Um, my phone is a couple of years old, so it uh -huh. not has like the latest um, video you know, like the latest specs, but it does everything, can take pictures, I can watch YouTube, I can go on uh, Google Chrome and surf for like, you know, many, many tabs. <laughs> I have okay. endless tabs open. I can do all my homework. I can do my uh, work, um, my job. Like I can do everything on it. So, yeah. Well, I, I, Mary, that sounds pretty impressive. Rav, I, I, is, is, is there anything that, that you could do that, that Mary's phone can't, you know? No, it's basically, I would say it's the uh, same thing. Uh, obviously, one of the one of the features that they do talk about, uh, you know, all the phones do obviously take uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, they do talk about the quality of the camera that uh, this new phone has compared to some of the previous generations. So the quality of the videos and pictures, which was also a selling point. Okay. So there's uh, some of the processing time, quality of the pictures, customer service, some of those things you you felt were better. Well, we we may be able to to end the the lecture right here because this in essence is is the reimbursement question. We've we've just done a health uh not a health, but we've done a technology assessment and we've figured out uh that there are different options out there. And that in my upgrade that I desperately need to do, I've, I've, I can pay $400, I can pay $1,500. Um, and it seems like in both instances, I can, get a, I can get video, I can watch YouTube, I can make phone calls, I can get my emails, I can do my work. Um, maybe there's better customer service um, on, on Rav's side. Is, is that worth $1,000 or $1,100? Yeah, I'm not sure, but that's... That's the um, uh, that is the essence of uh, that's the essence of that technology assessment, and I'm going to decide what I pay for. And the fact of the matter is that um, what what uh, that that we um, go through a um, technology assessment the same way government does in just about everything we do. And whether we're buying a new phone or whether we're going to uh, Food Basics and deciding whether to buy the house brand or or to buy the real Oreos um, uh, or whether we're going to Tim Hortons or Starbucks, they both serve coffee. One's a lot more expensive than the other. Um, we have to decide what value we get for that extra money. And governments are, are doing the same thing. 
And so that's really the essence of, of reimbursement. If you can think about your own uh, experience, every time you pull out your wallet, you're doing a an assessment of the value for money. And that's what reimbursement is all about. Um, as, as you see here, I'm, I'm a big fan of food basics uh, because I get, I think I get good value for money. But today we're going to be talking about the, the reimbursement basics. That's where we are today. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to jump to the course takeaway. Um, in every good presentation, I think there's, there's one slide where if you remember nothing else, remember this. Uh, and we have a, a nice picture here. Um, it's the core takeaway for the course. Can anyone hazard a guess as to where I'm going with this picture? Ahmed, any hands up there? I'll check out the chat. No, don't see anybody. Um, Mark. Oh, Mark. Yes. Uh, I'm just taking a shot in the dark here, but maybe the butterfly effect, you know, how Precisely. the wind caused by a single butterfly can transpire to much larger scale events. Excellent. That's you, you, you defy you, you named it and then you defined it as well. That's perfect. And that's exactly the, the image that I wanted to bring up because the core takeaway uh, for reimbursement uh, in, in, in achieving uh, reimbursement is understanding your impact. And if you understand your impact, you are going to build a much better reimbursement plan. And um, you have to also go beyond the obvious. Um, how does this uh, how does this impact uh, patients? Of course, that's that's an obvious one. Um, but there is also the impact uh, that you might have on nurses in an operating room uh, or a hospital administrator in his budget, uh, maybe a policy advisor in the in the minister of health's office, uh, different stakeholders. What do who are they and, and what motivates them and understanding the impact that you're going to have on them? Uh, is important because if you understand their impact, then you're going to be able to um, uh, potentially leverage them or or, or uh, mitigate their uh, their influence so that you can achieve your reimbursement. There's kind of a sub. There's a there's a sub core takeaway too, and it's it depends. Um, medical device reimbursement is when we talk about a medical device reimbursement system. But the dirty little secret is that there is no system. It's a it's a bit of a free for all. And it depends on 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 what kind of uh, medical device you have, um, what what class it is, what therapeutic area it is, uh, where it's used. So it 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 is a very very individualized process. Um, so certainly through the understanding of your impact, you'll also suss out the uh, the different uh, variables um, for uh, for for your medical device. Um, so I want to, I want to start by throwing out the case study question. So for those of you who can, we're in a bit of a, a workshop, uh, afterwards, uh, Rav, you're going to want to stick around for this. So Rav used to work for Alcon. So this is right up his alley. In fact, he could probably give the lecture today. Um, so, um, but I think all of you will find this interesting. We're going to look at an actual case study and we're going to go through and, um, uh, get a bit more practical on how we might achieve, achieve uh, reimbursement and, and what it means to stakeholders uh, and, and payers. And so I want you to have these questions in the back of your mind as we go through. And for those of you who are staying on, uh, Ahmed is going to fire off a, um, a document, or perhaps you already have, Ahmed. Yeah. Yes, I already shared it. I just want to double check. Perfect. Does everyone have access to the uh, 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 the document that I shared earlier with you today? Great. Okay, I'm, get, I'm getting some thumbs up. So good. Um, okay, so these are the questions that we're going to go through in, in that hour of the workshop. Um, where does the I stent fit on the HTA two by two matrix? Okay, there are a couple of key questions. What the hell is an I stent? Well, if you uh, read the document, you'll get a quick definition of the eye stent. We'll go through that uh, in the workshop. And then the HTA two by two matrix, this is core to, uh, to reimbursement, um, uh, particularly for drugs, but increasingly for medical devices as well. So um, as we go through, we'll define that HTA health technology assessment two by two matrix. What's the impact on your stakeholder? Well, what the heck is a stakeholder? We're going to talk about what a stakeholder is, what that means, 
uh, and how you how you interact with those stakeholders. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. What are your key messages to your stakeholder? What actions do you want your stakeholder to take? And what are the challenges in getting your stakeholder to take those desired actions? Um, so think about all of these as, as we go through, especially for those uh, who are going to be a stay behind for the um, uh, for the for the workshop. Um, so let's start off with a couple of definitions. What the heck is is a medical device? Um, who wants to read the Food and Drug Act's uh, definition here? Anybody? Yeah, I don't blame you. Just just ignore it. Um, it it's long. It's it's legal. Um, it's good to have. It's good to know. You want to know where to, to locate it, but. My own definition, I, I like better. I like to simplify things. What's the medical device? Well, it's something that's used to help patients, but it's not a drug. So if it's not a drug and it's used to help patients, it's a medical device. So um, an N95 mask, uh, a software that performs diagnostic image analysis for making treatment decisions in patients with acute stroke. Those are both, those are both um, medical devices. A toothbrush is a medical device. Uh, a transcatheter heart valve is a medical device. You can see some pictures there on the right-hand side. All of those things are, are medical devices. There's needles, there's bandages, there's gloves, Band-Aids, uh, there's tape, very simple stuff, some more complex. They're all medical devices. They're used to help a patient and it's not a drug. Um, I just wanna to touch on the classification. So this is when you're getting Health Canada approval, um, there's obviously a difference between a transcatheter valve, a pacemaker, uh, and a Band-Aid. And so Health Canada looks at medical devices and says, okay, there's a, there's a risk classification here. So, so they look at the degree of invasiveness. So a Band-Aid versus a hip replacement. Those are very different things when it comes to uh, the, the degree of invasiveness. Duration of, con uh, duration of contact. A stethoscope and a pacemaker are both medical devices, but very different durations of contact. So again, different risk profile. The body system affected. So if you are using screws to repair a broken leg versus a heart valve, again, both medical devices, but one is uh, much more important and risk laden than the other. A local versus systemic event, uh, local versus systemic events effects. So a needle versus an aortic stent, um, th those are, are two, uh, two extremes with lo the local versus systemic effects. So the, the government looks at all these things and they says, okay, what, 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 what is the risk level? And then, they, and then they put you into class one to class four. Class one, low risk devices, wound care, non-surgically invasive devices, uh, class two, class three, all the way to cl class four. So you won't be surprised to know that class four is is the is the high risk de devices or higher risk devices such as pacemakers, surgically invasive uh, devices, um, devices that diagnose uh, or control or, or correct the defect in the central nervous system. So those are the two extremes, uh, one to four. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But if you're getting into the lingo of of um, uh, medical devices, you're going to want to understand the difference between one and four. And there's a difference, by the way, in, in how fast you can get something approved, uh, class one versus a class four uh, advice, uh, a device. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Differences in um, how different jurisdictions, we're focusing on Canada today, but uh, other jurisdictions, US and, and Europe, Australia, they have a similar classification system. The US has one to three, but it's the same, it's the same concept. It's based on the, on the same thing. Okay, time for uh, a uh, some interaction. Who wants to answer a trivia question? Ahmed, who do I have that's going to answer a trivia question? Um, oh, I got a hand there. Ann Woods. Okay. Oh, Ann's going to get this one. Oh, shoot. You said trivia. I, I know. Couldn't I know. Help but this, yeah. so who who is this? Tommy Douglas. Tommy Douglas. You know, I you're absolutely right. So Tommy Douglas and and can we and just share who Tommy Douglas is? Tommy Douglas is the it depend I suppose it depends on who you asked if the father <laughs> of socialized medicine sounds that, like a good thing or a bad it. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll call him the father of socialized. Kiefer Sutherland's grandpa? 
You know, and I got, it's funny <laughs> you should mention that because I, 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 so I teach at the university and really uh, smart, just delightful kids. Uh, you know, they're, they're in their twenties and you know, who is this guy? They, they haven't a clue. And then my first clue is Kiefer Sutherland's grandfather. And they, I get blank stares. Who the hell is Kiefer Sutherland? So I, so he's not, he's not an A-lister anymore. So it does, uh, does cause a bit of a challenge. Well, I think he's, he's, Pretty much, he's viewed very positively. At least in 2004, he won the survey for the um, uh, the greatest Canadian uh, that uh, the CBC ran a, a program, and he came up as the as the greatest Canadian. So you're right, father of uh, of um, healthcare, and this is why we uh, don't have our credit cards when we go for healthcare. Everything that's medically necessary uh, is paid for. Um, but when it comes to medical devices, that doesn't mean that every medical device is paid for. Um, 70 percent of all medical devices are paid for uh, by by the um, by by the government or, or by hospitals, but the government um, are publicly paid for, let's say that. Uh, but that means that 30 percent are paid by other avenues. And that's something we're going to talk about. This is where the it depends comes in. Um, it depends on what the medical device is, whether they're going to pay for it. Uh, is an insurance company going to pay for it? Um, is it going to, you going to go direct to the consumer? Maybe you don't even want reimbursement. Maybe that's not going to help you, in which case it's a, it's a different conversation. But that's where we get into the, the it depends uh, concept. So Tommy Douglas, great, uh, great Canadian. Um, okay, what is, what is reimbursement? Can we have another volunteer? Somebody tell me what, what reimbursement even is. Give me a quick definition. Mark Antoine and Omid are the only two on my screen. So you guys are going to get picked on a lot. <laughs> there's a whole, there's like uh, right, 45 I'll, people I'll on the line, tribute. but I, <laughs> those are the only two I can see. Okay, so reimbursement is um, basically, well, I'll go for the typical example where I, I for my side would be, for example, I go to the physio, I have an out-of-pocket expense, and then I get uh, the reimbursement from the, from the, the insurer. Somebody, you're, you're not paying. Yeah, exactly. Someone else that's, is paying. So that's, yeah. yeah, no, that's that. And, and, and that's it. That's, that is uh, what reimbursement is. It's somebody other than the patient is, is paying the bill. Um, lots of, of more complicated definitions, but that's really what we're talking about is um, if you're looking for somebody else other than the patient to pay the bill, then we're talking about reimbursement. Um, and so uh, we have that strategic question, do we want reimbursement? Most of the time, the answer is yes, but that is certainly an important strategic consideration. Um, now, a quick um, model on, on how, how we optimize so let's, we're going we're gonna to take the position that we want reimbursement with a medical device. And so then the question is, how do we optimize um, our chances of, of getting reimbursement? And um, uh, for me, this is, this is the model that um, uh, is, um, uh, defines how to, how to do that. So uh, this is a, a kind of a Parthenon type building. So on, on the foundation, we've got Health Canada approval. You don't get anywhere unless you're Health Canada approved and you know you're a class one, two, three, four medical device, that's great. And then there's a health technology assessment recommendations. Um, now this one's a little bit fuzzy. If we were talking about drugs, yeah, you have always need a health technology assessment. Medical devices, it's really challenging because there are so many medical devices and they're so broad in their scope uh, that the health technology assessment um, has not yet. Um, uh, let me let me take a step back. The formalized health technology assessment. Every payer does a health technology assessment just the same way as if we go in the grocery store and decide if we're going to buy chicken on sale or we're going to buy beef for hamburger for dinner. There's a there's a health technology. There's a, 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 an assessment of value for money. Um, and so all payers will do a value for money assessment, either informal or, or, or formal. Um, so there is that health technology assessment uh, level. Um, we'll talk about the formal side. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the informal side. So great. So there's your foundation. So you, you've got um, uh, health can approval. You've got some kind of assessment or you think they're going to do an informal assessment. And then you layer on four pillars. And the first one is... Uh, value offering. 
Um, uh, and that is um, simply what is um, uh, what is um, uh, what value are you providing the patient? Um, perhaps you're saving lives, perhaps you're saving money, perhaps you're improving quality of life. What, what are you doing that, uh, that, that patients and people who are paying uh, are going to be interested in your medical device? Um, so great, so we, we save lives. We've got a medical device and uh, it saves lives. Okay, what is the strength of data? What does the data say? I, well, I actually don't have any data, but intuitively it makes sense that I'd save lives. Ah, okay, your pillar's gone. You're going to have trouble. Well, no, actually, I've got a lot of studies behind this, and it shows, it demonstrates uh, with clinical trials that there is a life-saving component, and, and here's the data. Okay, great. Um, level of advocacy is the next one. This is where we're going to get into stakeholders. Uh, are they enthused? Are they uh, excited are they going to be talking to payers and say, oh, this is this is fantastic. We need this. We need this for 20 years. So what's their level of excitement? What's the level of advocacy? And then there's that fourth pillar, which is support uh, or alignment with government priorities. Um, currently, there's a there's a, um, a some of you may know the, the deal that the provinces are making with the Ontario government, uh, with the with the provincial governments. Um, the, the federal government wants to tie that to certain parameters. Uh, if you're if you're a medical device that happens to fit into one of those priorities, there's going to be there's going to be money for uh, for surgeries, for example, that that may um, uh, that may help you. So uh, alignment or support with government priorities. And there's things like, um, you know, rare disease strategies, which we're still working to get. But uh, there's a diabetes strategy. So if you can fit into that, um, you know, you're going to you're going to increase your um, you, you may increase your possibility. Um, we um, I think we need to talk. The medical device uh, sector is big. I think that's all we really need to take away from here. It's about $410 billion, um, and it's divided uh, amongst uh, a bunch of things, uh, pretty much evenly diagnostic imaging, such as MRIs, uh, consumables, uh, patient aids, such as hearing aids and, and, and pace, uh, pacemakers. Um, we've got orthopedic products, uh, dental products, other medical equipment. Uh, that includes things like um, wheelchairs and ophthalmic instruments and anesthesia equipment and so on. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, Canada is $7 billion um, and, and global is $410 billion, just to be clear. Uh, and, and the global scene pretty much mirrors the Canada scene. There's not a lot of, lot of difference. And like drugs, most of you are probably aware of this, U.S. is by far the, the largest global market. In the case of medical devices, it's 43% of all medical device sales are, are in the U.S. So that's important to, to keep in mind. Okay, so let's go back to our model here. Um, and, and Ahmed, uh, I would encourage questions as we go, by the way. So uh, I can see your picture very clearly. So just wave at me, Ahmed, if, if, if anybody has a question that I, that I need to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so let's focus on a couple of things. Uh, let's focus on the value offering and the strength uh, of data as we go forward. And to a certain extent on um, uh, health technology assessment. And this is probably a good place to start. Now, as I say, most, most, Medical devices do not go through a formal health technology assessment process. Um, but this two by two matrix is, is what we're all doing in our heads. Um, and it's part of the uh, formalized process as well. So that's why I think it's worth, um, worth taking a little bit of time uh, on this. And this is a huge area. There are people who focus exclusively uh, at this at university. Uh, and there's a whole um, health economics and outcomes research uh, sections of, of governments, and um, so I'm, I'm not going to do this justice, given the fact that this is this is an entire career for people. But it's it, it I think is a good start. So we've got a two by two matrix, um, and we've got our cost effective. Um, we've got our uh, this is a cost effective analysis, um, and the x axis uh, is the difference uh, difference in costs. So we've got our iPhone, we've got Mary's iPhone, and we've got Rav's iPhone. Uh, there's a difference in cost. So cost A versus cost, minus cost B. Uh, in that case, it was $1,100. Okay, great. On the Y-axis, we've got the increased difference in effectiveness. Now, Mary's phone, uh, arguably not as effective. There certainly is some value pieces 
uh, if we're defining effectiveness to include customer service, for example. Rav said customer service is really big for him. Uh, let's assume that that is much better with the iPhone. Um, if I include that in, in my definition of effectiveness, okay, we've, we've, we've got a difference, but maybe I don't, in which case, if I just wanna make phone calls, send emails, watch YouTube videos, there's probably not a lot of, a lot of difference there, but that's, the, that's what we're looking at, increasing uh, difference in effectiveness the effectiveness of A minus the effectiveness of B. And then you have the two by two matrix. Okay, so with a medical device in, in quadrant one, you've got a medical device which is more expensive than the standard of care, ah, but wait, it's more effective. Okay, so now we got to figure out, okay, is there value for money? That's, that's the heart of uh, of um, medical device reimbursement. And most times, most new medical devices will notionally fit into that, into that square. Number two, you're more money, but less effective. Uh-oh, there's no health technology assessment that's gonna be required. You're done. That's not, that's not, that's not gonna work. So if you're less money and, and if you're more money and less effective, that's a tough, tough place to be. Um, number three is you are less money but you're also less effective. Well, I might save some money and can I stand to have a little less effectiveness? Do I need that strength of that effectiveness? And believe it or not, governments, hospitals, payers will, will look at that equation. So, okay, maybe there's a, a cost effective, maybe we've got something we can work with there. And then um, for your less money and more effective. Oh, well, that's a, that's a dream place to be. That's a no-brainer for payers. If you're less money and I get more effectiveness, however I've defined it, okay, we're good to go. Um, and then, so then what health economists do is they drop a straight line right through that. Uh, and if you're uh, above the line, you're not cost-effective. Remember, uh, the uh, more money, less effective, that's quadrant two. That That isn't even, that's, 100% that is, uh, that is not cost effective. And then on the right side, the lower side of the line, everything is cost effective. So again, you're less money, you're more effective, then you're, then you're cost effective. The, the gray area uh, are in quadrants one and two, uh, and that's where most, most products end up. Um, and certainly if, if you're a, a company, you wanna be in, in quadrant one, you wanna be, yeah, you wanna be more money, so that you can be profitable and reinvest in innovation, uh, but you also want to be re uh, more effective, and you want to be able to prove that. So uh, that's that's a lot um, uh, to go through. A couple more things just to to put into perspective. Um, you know, if you if you want the lingo, because everybody wants a bit of lingo, so you know you can be one of the cool kids. Um, so if you want to be one of the cool kids in reimbursement, you can start talking about your ICER. Um, now, what the hell is an ICER? So ICER is simply incremental cost effective ratio. It's your ICER. And that takes all the information that we just talked about um, and it, it creates a ratio. So your uh, cost A minus cost B, that difference, uh, that was the $1,100 that I'm going to pay for that, that fancy iPhone. Uh, and then the effectiveness, however you're defined. This is all theoretical, of course. So however I define effectiveness, is there more effectiveness? And then I get a ratio. And then we can talk about, um, and then we can talk about our ICER. That's a similar, um, that's, a, that's a simple way of, of talking about um, cost effectiveness. We've got cost, other cost benefit analysis that measure uh, dollars. Uh, there's cost utility analysis that do a non-financial, um, which, which is an important part, particularly in the drug side. Um, cost utility analysis measures quality of, of adjusted life year. So it's a measure of, of, um, of the, um, how many extra good quality years uh, you get if you use this medical device. It's called a quality, another, another lingo that you can, uh, you can throw around. There's all kinds of crazy uh, um, uh, analyses that can be done, but certainly the ICER is, is probably the one uh, that is most important in understanding that difference of, of the four quadrants uh, and, and the cost effective. So when we get to the, the workshop afterwards, we're going to, um, we're going to um, um, ask about the cost effectiveness of the I stand. So that's where this is, this is gonna come in. 
Um, so who does HDA? Ah, yes, Ahmed. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Uh, how different those pillars are between the US and Canada when it comes to Medicaid or Medicare uh, coverage? The, the, um, the concepts are the same. The U.S. system is, oh, um, I mean, it's, I was going to, is it more complicated? It's differently complicated, um, uh, but it certainly is complicated. But the concepts of achieving optimal reimbursement are going to be based on the same things. It's going to be based on, uh, on, on the value offering, on your data, on the advocacy alignment with government, or I probably more precisely, I should say, payer uh, priorities. Um, more than government. So um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, so, so quite, quite similar. Um, so uh, HCA for medical devices, this is part of the problem with, with medical devices. If you're, if you're a drug, it's, there's one body. Uh, there's at least 43, there's probably and counting, 43 and counting public institutions of some description that do uh, HTA. So it gets very, very complicated. Um, uh, who is a fan of, um, oh shoot, what's the name of the show? Somebody tell me the name of the show. That's the next trivia question. What show is this? Grunkle Gravity Stan. Falls. <laughs> Gravity Falls. Thank you. Who, who was that? Uh, Mark? Me. All right. Another Bye. 10 points for you. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Gravity Falls this is an awesome show. Uh, and for those of you who are fans of the show, uh, Grunkle Stan has this bottomless pit. Uh, and so they're really a bottomless pit of, of HDA um, uh, uh, groups in, in Canada, which is part of the problem. There are a couple that are uh, ahead. One is the Canadian Agency for Drugs, Technologies and Health called CADF. They do all the drugs. So they're getting into a little bit of medical devices. And the other is Health Quality uh, um, Ontario. They do, some, they do some good reviews. And in fact, the, the one that we're going to be talking about at the workshop is one that's been done by uh, Health Quality Ontario. They do a really nice job. The problem is the volume of medical devices. Um, okay, so, so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the, the um, informal HTA um, and and some of the other issues that that are uh, there that are at play, and and some of the hidden costs can really uh, trip you up. This is why it, it's so important. Going back to the core message here is understand your impact. If you're putting a bunch of hidden costs on on the system or the hospital or the clinic, uh, you gotta you gotta factor those in. Is there is there a current fee code, um, for example? So if your if your technology uh, is something that's not done. Now, uh, there may not be a physician code, which, which means a physician doesn't get paid for using it. That's a problem. Um, some may still uh, use it, but it will, it will discourage the use in your commercial success. Um, is, is extensive training required for physicians and, and who's going to pay for that? Are there infrastructure requirements? Um, Rav, uh, you'll appreciate this one. At, at Alcon, uh, there were some um, infrastructure, uh, some walls that needed to be taken down in some cases in order to, uh, to put in the, the latest laser equipment for cataract surgery. Um, you got to factor that in. Who's, who's going to pay for that? And, and if you're expecting the hospital to pay for that, all of a sudden that impacts your cost and therefore your cost effectiveness. Um, is there an impact on someone's livelihood? If you're eliminating uh, a surgery, um, uh, AI was supposed to get rid of all radiologists. Uh, the opposite has happened, as it turns out. We need more radiologists because of AI. Uh, but that was that was the fear. So if you're eliminating uh, jobs or or somebody's role or contribution, um, what what's going to be their reaction? Um, they're obviously a stakeholder because they're they're impacted. So you need to understand those um, those pieces. Um, so let's go back to our model. Uh, that's value offering and the strength of data. Uh, quick pause if there are any questions. Okay, so we'll jump into uh, level of advocacy. Okay, um, what is a stakeholder? We need to define what a stakeholder is. I, I mean, I think this is probably intuitive. It's it's any group or or individual uh, that's impacted, affected um, by or that um, uh, could influence decisions uh, uh, or the actions of a payer. Um, so 
who would that be include? Well, it might be employers or suppliers or, or competitors could can be a stakeholder um, uh, because they're going to react to your new medical device. Uh, customers, consumers, um, advocacy groups, ac activists, community uh, governments is, of course, a stakeholder. Um, investors, uh, the professionals, academia potentially are a stakeholder. So any of these are are um, on, uh, the, these are um, are impacted. These are uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, so you need to understand your impact um, with these stakeholders. And and I'll just show you a quick uh, what I call the the wheel of influence. Um, so you have the decision makers in in the middle, um, and you have all these groups of of stakeholders um, uh, around. So at the top, uh, economic stakeholders. This would be groups like maybe the um, the Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, groups like that. Uh, then we go to the left, we go patient groups and advocates. Um, if if you type in a disease state, and I actually do this in my course, I get I get them to type in a disease state and and type in patient group in Google, it'll pop up. So there is a patient group for every uh, therapeutic area. Um, and if you're changing the dynamics of that therapeutic area, then you've got a patient group. You may have individual advocates that uh, that are excited or um, uh, or the opposite to your medical device. Media is definitely um, a stakeholder, key opinion leaders. And by that, I mean physicians who are um, uh, who by their stature influence other uh, physicians. Maybe they write a lot of papers. They do a lot of studies. They're at the podium. Uh, those are key opinion leaders. Health uh, healthcare professional associations, um, you know, the Ontario Medical Association, for example, might be a, a stakeholder. And then on the right hand side, we get into government. So there's the bureaucracy, and there's the pol uh, the political side, the politicians and advisors. And I'm going to get into that in a, a little bit, so you you understand exactly what I'm talking about, because that could be a, an area of fuzziness for. Uh, um, for um, for many people, and I call it a wheel of influence because, um, in addition to these individual groups uh, influencing the decision makers, the fact of the matter is that each of those groups can influence the other stakeholders. So the economic stakeholders can can influence the politicians, uh, the patient groups uh, can influence the media, can influence the bureaucracy. So there's this interconnectedness of of stakeholders, and that's why understanding your impact. And understanding who your stakeholders are is is so incredibly important, um, and 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 why it is uh, ultimately a, a pillar under under level of advocacy. Um, Mark, we do have a few questions in the chat. Oh, oh, super! Yeah, okay. Okay, you want to take them now? Uh, yep, absolutely. Okay. Uh, first one is um, Kath generally makes uh, reimbursement recommendations for the provinces, except for Quebec. Does CATS play a similar role for medical devices across the provinces, or is it different organizations in each province? Well, there, it's a good question. There are, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there are 43 uh, different organizations that will do some, and that, and that is, there's individual hospitals, there's larger organizations, and CATS does them as well. Um, the, the challenge with CATS um, uh, and, and any of these organizations is it's, they don't do all of them. And it's not a regular. Um, uh, it's not a regular activity, um, and and you may decide that you don't actually even want a health technology assessment because there is risk in in un undertaking that. Right? Comes back and says, "Yeah, you're no, not not cost effective." Does that answer the question? Yep. Um, Marge, do you want to uh, turn on your audio? Do you have? Any yeah, I'll, I'll unmute and ask it. I think that. So. It's a bit of a complicated question. I had to reword it a few times. Um, hi. So, so if Cadeth generally does these reimbursement recommendations for drugs for the provinces, so it seems to me like Cadeth has the lion's share of, of reimbursement recommendations for the provinces for drugs. And then you have NS, which does it for mm -hmm. Quebec. Mm -hmm. It seems to me now that medical device reimbursement is more fragmented mm -hmm. than drug reimbursement. Is that correct? Precisely. Yes. 100%. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, significantly more fragmented. Yeah. Um, and again, because, because there are so many more medical devices, um, and because um, uh, you can get a medical device approved fairly quickly. And so 
um, the, 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 the required evidence is less, uh, which, which means the data behind medical devices is often less robust, making that, that, that health technology assessment more complicated. So there's a few reasons why, and there's lots of people trying to figure it out, uh, which is why we have the fragmentation. Yeah, good question. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the second question uh, from Mark, when is the best time in the product development cycle to engage with an organization that would conduct an HTA? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a super question. And I'm going to I'm going to change the question and say, when is when is the right time to um, start um, thinking about reimbursement, thinking about stakeholders, thinking about HTA and strategically thinking, you know, do we want this reimbursed? Do we want to do an HTA if we do all of that sort of stuff? Um, you know, I, I in an ideal world, it's you're you're lining things up a couple of years before um, your medical device comes to market. Same with same with drugs. The reality is that, that is really difficult to do with the priorities the companies have. Um, but that, so my message is, you know, the sooner the better. Um, you you want to build relationships and trust with those stakeholders right you can't just walk into a, a, a stakeholder and say this is what i want you to do well if you don't have a relationship they're they're going to wonder who the heck you are so building those relationships ahead of time is 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 part of uh, building a, a strong level of advocacy pillar um so earlier is is better is is is, is the is the general answer there thank you mark um yeah and just one more final question uh uh, from Adriana, if there is no reimbursement for a treatment or service, uh, is that considered a delineation between what can be offered privately, like treatment or service enabled by a medical device? Oh, I see. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So if something doesn't exist and you come up with with something that now uh, solves that, um, is is are you able to uh, circumvent the the public system? Um, so there's a very um from, from a it depends <laughs> so we're going to come back to that because you know if your if your medical device is used in hospital um your your reimbursement is required uh patients don't don't charge for um uh Patients don't get charged. Now, um, let me let me jump to the eye stent uh, that we're going to talk about earlier. Um, and prior to that, was a, a new concept. It was a new way of treating glaucoma. Um, and governments weren't paying for it, but the companies who had eye stents were trying to get it used. And so, what ended up happening is. You know, sometimes the co companies gave it away for free. Uh, sometimes it was absorbed in hospital budgets. I think even sometimes patients uh, paid for it. Um, so it, it was it was a bit of a mix. Um, uh, so, um, but but ultimately in, in that scenario, it, it wasn't sustainable to um, to have the patients pay. Uh, you really needed government reimbursement. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I know that only partially answers the question, but it really, it really does depend on on the on the um, on the medical device. Adriana, was that your question? Yeah, that yeah. that sort of touches on some of the themes, and I'm kind of curious at how that plays out in the new sort of emerging wellness space, for example, and and uh, and also culturally, like we're just as Canadians not used to paying for healthcare versus south of the border. Uh, a very different model. So, yes, and 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 so yeah, there is there is this uh, health and wellness um, uh, piece, and that's a that's a you know you can go into Shoppers Drug Mart and buy tons of medical devices off the shelf, including band aids, um, including um, all kinds of of medical devices, and and we we pay for those. Um, it, you know that's that's fine, and that's and that's why it 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 you know a strategic uh thought uh to look at what you want if, if you want it to be reimbursed is it's an important uh, part of, of the conversation um if you go into these um stores to get a home medical equipment um uh governments pay if i recall in ontario it varies by province but i think they pay 75 percent uh so if you need a wheelchair or stair lifts or things like that the government will i think pay 75 percent 
under the assisted devices program. Um, but uh, the, 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 the patient uh, the, needs to pay 25%. So um, yeah, there's all kinds of different, um, different scenarios. So I, I get to escape your answer, answering your question by saying it depends. No, thank you very much. Were, were, were there any other, there was there another question, Ahmed? Uh, no, that's everything. Okay. Thank you, Mark. All right, uh, so uh, let's go to the last pillar, which is uh, the government support. Um, okay, who who's who wants to, to to answer a trivia question? I don't want to ask Mark Antoine again. That's not fair. Ahmed, do we have do we have somebody? Do you have a volunteer? Uh, Mark has his hands up. So uh, Mark, all right, <laughs> awesome. You you're going for another ten points. Uh, I'm probably okay. going to get this wrong, but I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, who? Who, so I'll give you a hint. These are two of the um, most powerful government officials in the province of Ontario. Hmm. Uh, Who's the one on the left? Either Rob or Doug Ford. I'm going to go with Rob Ford. Oh, Doug Ford. <laughs> but I, <laughs> <laughs> you, you could have just said Mr. Ford, Doug. Uh, Mark, should have Mark, so Mark. that's, yeah. Um, <laughs> who's... Who, Amelia. Who's the, who's the other uh, one? That's oh. even harder. Um, um, Amelia, no, Amelia's can jumping I steal? in. Yeah. Amelia What's can I steal? In my place. Mark, do you want to call a friend? Because I can, I can be Absolutely. a like Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Mark and our tag teaming on this. Um, we've got the older brother, Doug, the premier of the province. Yes. And then we have Michelle Demanuel on the right, who's the head of the uh, civil service in Ontario. Also former wow. head you, of you Trillium know. Health. You're yeah. you're ruin you're ruining my presentation because no one ever in in all of the presentations I've given has ever gotten um, uh, the uh, the secretary of cabinet. So the 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 point is that the person on the right is the head bureaucrat in the province, and they give they give a really downplayed title, secretary of the cabinet. Can you imagine? So she's head of the public service, a clerk of the executive council. She's a clerk and a secretary. Uh, I don't know where they get these titles from, but she is the head of the public service. And I say these are, are the two most powerful uh, government officials in the province of Ontario. Um, we could we could have a debate as to who is who is more powerful. Um, but the, but the point is, we all know that the one on the left is is one of the Fords. Uh, and um, aside from, a, 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 you know, the, the odd person, the very odd person. <laughs> so 10 points for you, by the way. Um, uh, Thank the, you, Mark. Uh, Yes, you're you're welcome. Actually, 20, 20 points for that one, but um, very, very not not well known, and yet an incredibly powerful uh, person. And so, I just want to get quickly into the um, uh, politicians versus, versus bureaucrats. This is really important. Um, so, on the political side, uh, these are the guys uh, that you're going to see on your television and knocking on your door. You know, there's a thousand politicians and staff. Um, there's probably five or ten who actually govern. Um, and they are, um, they're structured into different ministries. So you probably heard of the ministry of health or the ministry of transportation, each has a minister and then they've got some staff. Um, I was going to sh show you a couple of things, but I think we're running a little short on time. So I'm going to skip, uh, skip other, a couple of things here, but from a longevity perspective, um, this is every four years. We, we just had an election, a provincial election, not so long ago. So, uh, we've got these guys for another four years. Um, their primary role is policy, which means they have the ideas. Oh, we should uh, we should build uh, we should build some roads. Um, that's a that's a that's a policy. Or we want some um, some more surgical centers. Uh, that's in the news, right? The more more surgical centers that are privately owned but publicly funded. That's a policy. Um, they're the guys in front of the camera, um, and I've got at the bottom there power with a question mark. Uh, it, it it depends on the bureaucratic side. Uh, instead of a thousand politicians staff, you got sixty thousand plus in Ontario. So these are this is everybody who's running the the mechanisms of government. These are the people that are um, doing everything from from um, renewing your license uh, to um, organizing the the building of hospitals, and and they take the policy and and transform it into uh, they implement it. So they're the ones that are going to be trying to figure out how to make these medical centers, uh, these private medical centers, work. Uh, their primary role, administration. They implement the policy. Uh, they stay in the shadows. Uh, they've got jobs for life or thereabouts. Um, and the ministries mirror the the um, are, are mirrored to the, the political side. So there's on the bureaucracy. There's a minister of health. There's a ministry of health rather, ministry of transportation, 
and so on and so forth. So um, the reason why I differentiate these is because if we're going to understand our impact, if we're going to understand our stakeholders, we're, we're going to want to know, okay, with this medical device, am I speaking to the political side or am I speaking to the bureaucratic side? What are the dynamics of, of the medical device reimbursement that will guide me one way or the other or, or both? And what ministries do I want to talk to? So that can get very, very complicated. Um, so that's a very, very quick snapshot. Uh, but if you have your value offering, strength of data, level of advocacy, you've got your support with, with payer uh, priorities, um, and you've got that on a strong foundation of, of Health Canada approval and some value for money, then your reimbursement is, um, uh, is um, the, the potential for, for being reimbursed is, is going to be mac maximized. And that's, uh, that's, what you're, that's what you're looking at doing. Um, now, um, we're supposed to wrap up at, at, uh, at 5.30. Um, yeah. But if, if you want to take a few minutes, uh, Mark, that, that's also fine. Um, I, I, there, there are a couple of things. I was a little bit too chatty here. I want to, I think, I think this slide here is an important one to touch on because um, there are, are many bodies that will um, uh, purchase medical devices. And, and this, is, this is a good framework for understanding their approach. Uh, this was from Advancing Healthcare in Ontario, Optimizing the Healthcare Supply uh, Chain uh, back from 2017. Really good report. This graphic, I think, illustrates really nicely how, how the system procures, um, uh, purchases medical devices. So you've got three different colors in the pyramid, and then you've got three different, um, uh, four different, different levels. So um, uh, at the bottom, uh, you've got... Um, you've got indirect, um, indirect commodities. Uh, so this might be like um, a, a couch in a waiting room, or um, you know, office chairs or office furniture. Um, there's those indirect commodities. Then we've got direct clinical commodities that you know, band aids, uh, uh, hospital beds. Um, then you've got the medical technology. Um, that's where you've got, you know, the pacemakers or the um, the new uh, the new lens for a cataract, and then you've got innovation on top of that. Uh, that is the um, it was raised before where we're doing something that we haven't done before. It's truly innovative. Where um, we have an eye stand. We're going to be talking about that. That was was innovation. So those are the the, the levels, and then look at the colors because this will tell you. Um, uh, a lot, you want to position yourself on this to understand, okay, what, what, what can I charge? Well, if you're, if you're in the, in the, in the, all three colors are blue, which is silly. So the medium blue, the big blue, um, you're purchasing for price. Um, and so there's, you're going to be, you're going to have a very difficult time demonstrating that you are, um, different or, or adding value. Now that's not always true. So, um, you know, maybe there's something, um, there is a, a small sliver of the medium blue and a very small sliver of the, of the dark blue. Direct clinical commodities, a hospital bed, I think is a, is a great example. Um, you know, a hospital bed is a hospital bed. Oh, until somebody introduces technology that actually um, can measure patient vitals embedded in the hospital bed. Um, uh, and so something like that is, now we get into the, um, into the lighter blue where we're purchasing products and service where we have to do that cost-effective analysis. Or maybe it's a, it's a complete solution, uh, in which case we're willing to pay more because it really does uh, solve, uh, solve the problem. And that goes up into each, uh, each section. And the higher you go, the more likely you're going to be in that position where you're, where, where you're a solution and viewed as very high value, um, uh, as opposed to a commodity. And certainly that's where you want to be if you're coming up with a, with a medical device. So that's a, a really good snapshot. Um, and I'm over time. I'm just going to flip through and see um, uh, if there's anything else um, that we should talk about. Uh, the flow of money is important. What I will say is uh, buying groups is the other thing that's very important. Um, two big ones, uh, Mohawk Med Buy and Health Pro. Um, they're an intermediary that uh, will negotiate with medical device uh, companies, uh, drive down the price, 
so that hospitals get a, a better deal. Um, we could we could debate whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it certainly puts a, a damper on innovation if prices are driven down. Um, but that's a that's a discussion. That's a political discussion we can have later. Um, there's also a few avenues for uh, government direct re reimbursement. So there's hospitals, but then the Ministry of Health does some. Uh, there's physician or laboratory billing codes. Um, there might be specific government funding priorities. There's also all kinds of other organizations. So, um, you know, reimbursement is, is the patient not paying for it. Uh, but who is paying for it? Is it the government? Well, what does that mean? Is it a hospital? Is it, a, is it, is it, um, uh, is it direct funding? Is it, um, uh, and here we've got some other examples. So private healthcare organizations or allied healthcare professionals as regional health authorities, long-term care facilities are a, are a big one. Uh, hospital charitable foundations, possibly paying for a, a, a fancy new MRI, uh, could be private donors. So there's all kinds of, of, of things and, and you, you're, you're fundamentally going to need to understand who is going to pay for your product potentially. Um, if you don't know that, that's you're, you're dead in the water. So that is, that is so key. Um, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I'm, I'm sorry for going a little bit over. Uh, but happy to take questions. Um, I think we've got an hour break, so I'll um, uh, the workshop. Um, thank you very much, Mark. That was such an uh, exciting and insightful uh, session. Um, I think I saw a question in the chat. Um, yeah, from Nargis. Uh, she was asking, can there be a such a go-to-market strategy for a medical device to sell without relying on the reimbursement for a while before getting approval for reimbursement? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and that, yes. And it, it, it depends. It's, it's going to depend on what your, um, what your medical device is. But there is some uh, business rationale for... Um, building um, a, um, a, a, a building a market, bi building excitement, um, uh, getting it onto the market, having patients pay um, and, and and building up the the, uh, the volume and the interest uh, and then turning back and trying to get it reimbursed. That is certainly one one avenue that you could take. But again, it, it, it depends depends on the, on the medical device. It's a, it's a pretty, it's a, you know, if you're actually into this, you're, you're probably going to want to um, get somebody who has some expertise uh, in the particular area that can, that can help guide you. Um, but um, yeah, that's a good question. Moment, you've got a question. I can see you. Hi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, how can we know, so I, assuming each of the list, the last slide that you mentioned, are paying for a certain problem, or they all you, you can get reimbursed from any of them. I, I mean, is there any certain reference that we can go and look, for example, for if you have a developed bed source for treatment of bed source, who is going to pay? Mm -hmm. How can we figure that out? Yeah. Um, no, there is no, <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, resource. So it takes some expertise, some insight, some intuition, um, you know, product for, for bed sores, that's a, that's a good example. Um, so, um, you know, long-term care facilities are going to be uh, an important uh, purchaser. Hospitals are going to be a, an important purchaser. Um, there is certainly um, the medical, um, assisted medical devices program in Ontario, similar programs across the country. That's where the government will pay 75%. So it's a home care is what I'm saying. So there's a, there's a home care um, uh, avenue for uh, for bed source. So it's again, it's it's the it depends, right? So you sit down, you figure out, okay, who's who's going to use this, uh, and then who will potentially pay for it? Um, who is who um, uh, who is impacted by this? Um, and if you can answer those three questions, that's a really nice start because the, the the answers to those three questions will lead you down the path of okay, what do we what do we need to do? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, um, can you just repeat those three questions? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so who's uh, who's going to pay? Um, 
uh, who's who's going to be impacted? Um, and what was it? What was the third question? <laughs> I just I just write those off the top of my head, and I can't remember what I said. So it was um, yeah, certainly. So who who's who's the impact? Um, who's impacted? Um, who's going to purchase it? Um, and um, yeah, there was a third question. I don't remember what it was. All right, so let's say there's two questions. Who's who, who's impacted? I mean, who's it going to benefit? Is is you know the so the patient? That's really I think it's a it's a repetitive question because it's it's um, uh, um, the, the the patient is going to be impacted. So so how are they impacted? But um, who who's impacted and who's the um, who's the um, uh, who's going to pay for it? And we'll have to to do a rewind on the on the recording, Ahmed, and and see if that third question was was worthy of repeating. I will. Yeah, I will share the recording. So we'll get yeah. to it. There are actually three questions. <laughs> uh, we have also Rafael who has a question. Uh, go ahead, Rafael. Hello there. Uh, first of all, thanks for the lecture. It was great. Pleasure. And uh, one quick question is how to make sure that uh, our solution is aligned with the political priority or political landscape, right? Uh, is it something to do with the GPOs? We need to go through the plexus or Mohawks of the, of the world or, or is it something different um yeah it so so it's it's payer priorities um and so um rather you know I, I should have payer priorities rather than specifically government priorities because there are different there are different payers and government's sort of too general a term um so um there are different aspects of this and you need some insight into the organizations, but I'll, I'll, I, I use one example earlier whereby the federal and provincial governments are making deals on, on expanding, um, expanding the funding and some of that funding is going to be targeted on uh, surgeries and, and other things. So all of a sudden those are priorities. Um, but if you look at the uh, group purchasing organizations, the Med uh, Mohawk and, and Mohawk Med Buy and um, uh, and Health Pro, um, I think it's Med Medhawk um, Mohawk um, um, uh, Medby. Health Pro may do this as well, but they have a channel for really innovative products. Um, so they're they uh, are prioritizing those solutions. That dark blue um, sliver in the in the triangle we showed previously. So if you have something that is truly a solution, then you can go directly to them and they will, um, they will actually do uh, some pilots. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a laborious process, but as you, as you figure out, okay, you know, who's this gonna benefit and, and, and where's your impact and who's gonna pay for it? Um, if you start to define those, then you can determine what their priorities are um, it, it's part of the stakeholder mapping. So if you understand who your stakeholder is, understand what the impact is, um, then then you are better able to determine. Okay, yeah, this does fit into um, into the priorities, and that and that takes conversation and uh, relationship development and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Again, that was a very engaging and insightful session. And thank you again for taking the time to educate our community on such a uh, very exciting and uh, topic in medtech innovation. So uh, I would suggest taking an um, 18 minute break and then uh, coming back here at six o'clock. Uh, is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. I'll resume with the workshop uh, part of that session. So, uh, okay. Again, we'll see you shortly um, in 18 minutes. Okay, thanks so much.